Coming up, a Sad Styles production. Hello and welcome. My name is Mikey Aaronworth, signing on to the Sign Off of Frameworth podcast for yet another week. It is the podcast where we talk about all the stories you didn't know you wished you knew about the world of sports and sports marketing. I am joined in studio for the first time in a few weeks by my loyal co-host, companion, and father. Did I mention father? And the president and of the Frameworth first Sports of the Marketing. Fifth. First of the new year. First of the new year. Happy new year to everyone. 2022. Uh, we got kind of ahead in the recordings. Uh, so so it's been a while since we've been in studio. Uh, but we did notice last week we did the Q&A episode. Yeah, tons of great. Tons of positive results. A lot of great feedback and, and some great questions for us to use as sort of a jumping off point. Uh, way more so that we dug into than we kind of anticipated. So we weren't able to get to all the questions and we'd like to get to the remainder of them today on the episode, but we will say moving forward, if you do have any questions, and we will kind of crowdsource them from time to time, but email your questions to signoffpod at frameworth.com, and we're going to start compiling them a little bit and getting to them either episode by episode or maybe once a month when there's enough of a backlog, yeah. we'll do another focus of it. I don't know about you, Deb, but I actually love doing this. No, it, you know what? It was really interesting for me because some of the questions were really good yeah. uh, in terms of me having to think about things. and Which uh, you normally don't do. No, I don't think at all. No. <laughs> and so what we end up kind of kind of uh, making me think about different ways to market different items, yeah. uh, what people are interested in, uh, kind of indicates to me what we should maybe move move forward on, Absolutely. et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, keep sending those questions in. And also, I mean, we've been involved in this industry for such a long time that I think oftentimes we lose sight of some of the more confusing or confounding things about the industry. You know, things that are commonplace to us may not have ever been referenced by some of the collectors out there. So some of the questions today, especially, are... You know, it's something that we think about every day, uh, and I don't know that most collectors have ever had a specific answer on them. And and I'll, I'll mention it when I when I bring this one up uh, uh, specifically. But but there's there's wait a ton one all second because just something that occurred to me. Uh oh, some something that happened in the last podcast uh -huh. made our ratings in Japan go up <laughs> fifty. To like to, to top twenty five podcasts for sports in Japan. Yeah. Now, how does that happen? Who asked a question that sparked that big surge? And by the way, uh, thanks to all you listeners in Japan. Don't know how you found us, but we do appreciate you listening. You're you're putting us way up in the ratings in Japan. Great. Maybe maybe it was our uh, my, my mention off the off the cuff of my obsession with video games. Who knows? You know, a couple there, people oh, fans you know of, fans of JRPGs out there. You oh, never know. There it could, you go. could be that. I don't know. The people people out there listening. Uh, no, but I'm excited to get to more of these questions. Uh, and and thanks again to everyone. Everyone who submitted and sorry we couldn't get to them on the last episode before we get to the questions as we always do on this podcast we wanted to give a big heartfelt thanks to those of you who have subscribed rated and reviewed our podcast by the way if you don't listen on iTunes and instead you listen on Spotify Spotify now allows ratings so if you're able to give us that five star rating they don't take reviews uh, but check on your app it's relatively new it'll allow you to give us a rating and shoot us back up those charts not only in Japan but in the rest of the yes. world as well wherever you're listening Canada counts you USA counts. counts, yeah. And and don't you try to tell a Canadian that we don't count. We've been trying <laughs> to tell everyone that we count for so long. We're tired of being the younger brother of the United States, but we're, we're and happy. we're sorry, very sorry if that offends anyone. Very sorry if that offends anyone. <laughs> we'll buy you a Tim Hortons to make it up to you. Um, uh, so so uh, a review out there. We're again selecting at random uh, as we as we typically do at the, the top of every episode. A five star review pulled from iTunes. Great job from uh, uh, is is the title of the review. Thank you all. So so much for doing this podcast. You all do such amazing stuff for collectors and for just us fans in these crazy times. Things like this keep the heart full. This was from Rory Frazier slash Clark Griswold. Uh, I'm not sure if the Clark Griswold thing is a. I hope that's your real name. Otherwise, you are Chevy Chase from Vacation. There you go. No, no. Uh, you know what? And I and I'm gonna say this because this is the first I heard of who that rating is from. Yeah, and it's actually somebody that follows us regularly. He's a sheriff out in the East Coast. Oh, nice. I've seen him through. So we didn't pick you because it was Rory, because this is the first I'm hearing about it. But congratulations, Rory. Uh, what, Signed, what do we uh, have for him? We okay, so I know uh, we're going to change that because he's an East Coast guy. Sure. So we'll get uh, Nathan McKinnon for Nathan photo. McKinnon, there we're you go. We're going to send you a Carey Price, but um, I know you're from the East Coast, so we'll change it to uh, Nathan McKinnon. 
So, uh, Rory, if you're out there, uh, make sure you email us. You got 30 days from the drop of this episode to email us, signoffpod at frameworth.com so we can get your shipping information and send that out to you. Hey, if you want a chance to win a free signed 8x10 photo from one of our athletes or an athlete that we've worked with, uh, make sure to leave us a rating and review on iTunes is the best way to get it uh, for us to, to, to get that on our radar. As always, though, Spotify helps quite a bit. Anytime you see a chance to rate and review the Sign Off podcast, uh, make sure you do so. But that's enough of that. I'm tired. My hand hurts from patting myself on the back. It's been tough. Uh, just like the past couple weeks have been tough for you and myself, Dad. Wow. Let, can yeah. we can we talk about yeah. this a little bit? Look, COVID is... Thanks, is, Mikey. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Earning that explicit rating on iTunes. Um, uh, COVID is now back in the news, obviously. Uh, it's it's uh, The Omicron is kind of surging through everyone. A lot of people are getting it. Uh, businesses are forced to compensate and, and, and dial things back a little bit. There's limitations to gatherings. We're dealing with a lot of that, and we may touch on that uh, as a result of some of these questions as we move in. But over the break, uh, I actually tested positive for the virus. You did as well, Dad. Well, uh, you brought it into our house. Because of me, apparently. <laughs> uh, me, as the most careful person in our family, ended up being the one who brought it home. Uh, so this is just a way to say if we seem a little bit tired or off, it, it lingers. It lingers. Well, I'm, we're over it now for the most part. But I will say to those people out there, um, this this having COVID, what I thought was the, the worst thing in the world, uh -huh. this new variant, um, we were triple vax or I was, my wife was Lori and, uh, hardly affected us at all. Yeah. Um, felt like a small cold. So just take it with a grain of salt. You're probably going to hit, get hit a lot harder if you get it and you don't have vaccinations, but that's your call. Do what you need to do. Yeah. It's, uh, it, you know, just from, a uh, 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 our own subjective perspective, it, uh, it very much appears that I have, I have, uh, two vaccinations. I, I was waiting for my booster. I had my boot. I had to cancel my booster because I got COVID, which was, which is a weird one. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's, it hit me a little bit harder than it hit you guys as well. I did know someone who got it at the same time as me, who was not vaccinated, uh, saw what I was going through, saw what you guys went through. And, uh, and, and this person had said that that they now kind of see the results of of what a vaccination could potentially do. So we're not here to to, to pander or to, to put anything out there. But from our experience, wow, it, it did kind of help us uh, get get over yeah, that. And we're, sure. we're we're on the other side of it, thankfully. Uh, and we're now here on the other side of this new year. We turn the page in the calendar and we find ourselves in January of 2022. 22 is my favorite number, by the way. I don't know if you knew that about me. When I played sports, it was always number 22. Rick Vive. Rick there you go. Well, guess why? Yeah. Um, so we uh, uh, let, let's start off with a question. Kind of, I, I like these sort of general questions to start us off and kind of get us warmed up. Trevor Golem asks, what is the rarest signature a customer's brought into your business to get framed? And what is the most interesting non-sports signature item your business has framed? Do you have any recollection? I mean, you have a lot longer in this. Well, industry. I do know the, the, the most the, the best thing, or not the best thing, but one of the most valuable things that came in, and this is an interesting story. A good friend of mine, um, uh, Terry Clancy, mm -hmm. uh, haven't seen him for a while, but uh, happens to be the son of King Clancy, right. uh, one of the all-time great uh, Leafs back in, way back in the day when he played, and then he was part of the coaching staff under you know uh, Harold Ballard's regime. And uh, Regime. He's, it's only Harold Ballard... It has it called his regime, regime. Eh? It's only, everyone That's else our, is just their organization. Well, you had to grow up in the era to understand yeah. what that was about. I met him many, many times and he was a different a character for sure. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, ran old school hockey. Um, and there's so many stories that some of those great players from that era could tell you about how he treated them good, bad, or ugly. And, uh, a man and, that Lou Lamorello would say needed to kind of take a little bit of a step back. Yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. <laughs> he ran it with an iron fist. No yeah, question. Yeah. But Terry Clancy brought in a, or Terry Clancy's wife, uh, brought in a Jersey to be framed. And I looked at it and she said to me, uh, Brian, she says, I was thinking, you know, the Jersey, this is way back. This is 95, 96, something like that. And said, uh, I think um, this jersey is going to be too big for the wall. Why don't we just cut the logo off the front of it and we'll, um, we'll frame that and then I'll just, you know, tuck the jersey away. And I said, well, what is the jersey exactly? It was a wool jersey. So, well, oh, no, it was one of King's, King Clancy's 
game oh, worn wow. jersey. So she wanted to cut the logo. She she didn't know any better. And I said, I don't think I'd be touching that at all. And matter of fact, this thing should be in the Hall of Fame. She said, What are you talking about? And I said, I know just previously I was reading about a Ted Kennedy jersey, original jersey that went to the Hall of Fame and it was valued at about a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, obviously they're very, very rare. Right. And I said, I can't imagine what this would be worth because at the time, I think King was still active uh, with the team, with the team, or at least he was still around. Anyway, she she immediately got on the phone to her husband, um, King Clancy's son Terry, who was in the insurance business. Said, "Can we get a rider on this jersey?" He says, <laughs> "Brian says it's worth a hundred grand," and I don't know exactly what it was worth, but that was the was the most impressive unsigned piece. In terms of sign pieces, the rarest that I've seen. What What are your thoughts before you get into that? If that jersey were signed, would it add or detract from the value? That's a good question. Um, I'm thinking more as time goes on, people are saying that it's better signed, but I think that's more for current things. Right. It used to be don't touch it if it's an original, yeah. but like a hockey card Sure. Uh, years ago, and I'm not a card expert by any means, but it, I was told years ago don't sign it it's more valuable unsigned but now i'm starting to see that it's better signed right especially with upper deck coming out with signed cards that are hidden in packages etc so i think that that changes all the time mm -hmm. i would personally not want to have that jersey signed it, it in my world of collectibles uh, uh something should be in the exact same state it was in the original form so when we frame a jersey right uh, we use pins and, and as little, uh, try and uh, make as little change to the jersey. So small pinholes are one thing, staples are another. You don't want to do that. Right. You don't want to glue anything. Something you don't that's wanna, not going to permanently right. damage the, right. the, uh, the So the when you take it out of the possible. frame, it should be in the same p condition as it was when it went in, as close to it as possible. Right. So sorry, you were going on about maybe the, the most. Yeah, I don't know. That's product. a really tough question because there's so many things over the years that have come through here. And the very rare things. I also had a, a guy wanting to bring in a Lou Gehrig uniform and cut it up and put little piece in every frame and i just refused to do that because i just couldn't bear to see an original jersey uh being cut up uh i probably signed muhammad ali things uh you and the, the muhammad day. ali yeah I love well it. I he love was it. such a great yeah. great man um any any of those old school like ben hogan type things but the babe ruth baseballs um those are really cool to see and i don't know how the signature lasts but back in those days, it was like a ballpoint pen. Yeah. And, and they, they still stay intact. It's amazing. Do you have a signed product? I know, I know you have a ton of signed products tucked away, but is there, I don't know, know if I've ever asked you this, is there a signed item that you have that is either from, it could be Muhammad Ali, but from someone that means a lot to you? And I know you've, you've already mentioned that the signature doesn't mean as much to you as the experience in your position of having gotten it. Is there a signed piece that does mean that much to you? It, Two pieces come to mind immediately. One is the one hanging in my vestibule, which is... Um, vestibule? Ve I, Do you have a signed dictionary from William Shakespeare? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> my outer office. Okay. Uh, it is a signed, it's 20 by 24 black background uh, portrait of uh, Maurice Richard mm. holding the torch up. Right. You see it every day. Yeah. And it, it has a um, beautiful handwritten gold signature on it. Uh, there was only five made. Uh, Bobby Fisher, who was the not the chess player, but um, the uh, photographer for the Montreal Canadiens, one of them took it, and there was only four done, and he made an extra one for me because I framed all the pieces mm, for nice, free, and nice. Maurice got one, and he got one. So there's only five of those. And the other one that I value tremendously is a great shot by Annie Leibowitz, which is hanging in my office. Wayne Gretzky and Gordy Howe in the dressing room. Looks like they had just got off the ice, sitting there shooting the shit back and forth with their equipment half on and the rest hanging behind them. And it was taken by Annie Leibowitz. Um, and it was a gift from Wayne and Mike Brown to me. And it's signed by both. I would never sell that. 
Mike Brown, uh, just because you mentioned his name, we had an episode on him, uh, the founder, I, I guess, and 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 progenitor, uh, progenitor. There you go. I got my science uh, uh, dictionary by William Shakespeare as well of WG Authentic, Wayne Gretzky Authentic, right. WGA being uh, one of the uh, uh, sought after, highly sought after certificates of authenticity, a company that's no longer in circulation. Therefore, nowadays you get the upper deck one. But a, a very interesting episode on Mike Brown right. that we did a couple months ago. If you're interested in the beginnings of Wayne Gretzky's memorabilia days, uh, in, in that form definitely check that one as as well right um so let's move on to another question uh thank you trevor for oh what about non-sports signature do you have a non-sports well that was oh non-sports signature yeah non non non-sports item of any Uh, sort you know not really no oh well you know what there was a piece of uh back in the day of well, you most people listening to this wouldn't even remember the name, but Golda Meir was prime minister of Israel, and they did a um, one of the first pieces that Time magazine launched uh, artwork with a signature from the from the person rather than the artist, and that all uh, actually translated into sports from from that piece. So it was great people in history signed the portrait of themselves by the artist. So the artist signed it in the portrait. So she signed that as the prime minister of, of Israel. And then there were other pieces followed up in that same genre, which was a Jack Nicholas piece. So before that, it was the artist that signed the yeah. thing. And then it became, well, we'll th- add the athlete signature too. And then it flip flop where the athlete signature was more, more than, the artist. than the artist. And yeah. we experienced that firsthand. On one of our first episodes, we told the story about uh, Borea Salming and Daryl Sittler. Right. Same sort of thing yeah. where where we uh, an artist. Do you remember the name of the artist? Harvey Sobel. Harvey Sobel had uh, had drawn a a picture of of Sittler and and Salman. Was this at the same two time? Separate two separate pieces. Se- two, yep. two separate pieces. But at the same time, we we did yep. this right. Yep. And the idea was initially just to have the artist sign it, and we kind of had the idea of like, well, why don't we bring the, the well? I, I'll correct you on that because you weren't around at the time, but uh, we actually took the idea from the Time Magazine once. Oh, interesting. So. They started doing the, that one with the prime minister and other famous people. I forget who else was in, in that uh, genre, but then there was uh, Jack Nicholas. I remember them doing. And then, so we took that idea and said, well, let's, let's try it with Sittler and Salming, which was the first piece that my father's company ever did. And we never followed up in the right. sports memorabilia business. Right. And then Not for when years. I, I left that company and started this company we started playing around with the idea again. See, I didn't realize that's where you got the idea from it. Yeah. From the Time yeah. Magazine article. That's that's cool. It I, was a brand new concept. Nobody yeah. really even thought about it. I mean, autographs were out there, but right. not to have an artist paint something and then and then the athletes. So autographs it. just existed, what, as as signed balls, pucks, those sorts of Generally things? Generally, those things or an 8 by 10 photo. And could, or, you, could you go anywhere to buy them? Or was it like you had to show up and get it signed by the person? Like, what, you know, what did the industry look question. like? I'm point. trying to think back then whether, uh, I'm sure you could. There were small companies that specialized in getting an autograph and selling, but there weren't the memorabilia stores that there right. are today. I right. mean, now it's a, a, a given. Every street corner has one. Yeah. But back in the day, you collecting autographs was more something you'd do outside a hockey rink. Uh, you know, I remember as a kid waiting outside um, Maple Leaf Gardens uh, where the bus was to take the Chicago Blackhawks back to the airport. And, and there was a crowd of people waiting for right. autographs and the players were so great. They, they'd sign them all for yeah, you. Yeah. But you're, you're waiting, you know, 45 minutes to an hour after the game for the guys to shower up and get on the bus. Right. And generally it's a cold day, but people would do it. Huh. I love that. I love that. It's uh, just, again, the early goings of the industry. Not even that long ago. It's amazing to see how much the industry has grown. Well, I'm talking 50 years ago because I'm 65 and I'm maybe 15 when I okay. took my little... <laughs> well, I was, I was talking more about the, the introduction of like the Salming and the Sittler piece. Well, that was seven in the late 70s. Okay, so still well. about yeah. 50 years. Okay, yeah, yeah. well, okay. Um, so Trevor, uh, thank you so much for those questions. Great questions there. Uh, another question having a, a, a little bit more to do with the actual, not the etiquette, but sort of the standardization of how to sign certain products. Uh, we have Greg Close, uh, or sorry, uh, this question's from Zach Z- Jobron. Zach Jobron, I hope I'm getting that right. Uh, he says, thanks for doing this. I got a two-part question. 
uh, two part question is very popular uh, in 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 these pod uh, these podcast episodes. Do you have a specific pen and color you recommend to use to autograph memorabilia? Does it vary by the type of product? For example, pucks, pictures, and jerseys. Uh, can you give the listeners some advice on how to properly preserve their autographs as well? Uh, a great question there. It is a really good question because this is uh, a big problem in in our industry. Um, when we first started, it was a Sharpie. You yeah, know, everybody always. had a Sharpie. It was supposed to be indelible. It's not going to fade. It's it's going to have the ink that's going to last the longest. But what we have found over the years is that, and it doesn't happen to all products, but sometimes, in certain, certainly when there's harsh light outdoor, if you have it near a window or if you have it um, um, under harsh lighting in your home, um, it will fade the autograph. And uh, unfortunately I have a number of pieces in, in my outer office slash vestibule, vestibule. Um, where Wayne's personalized some stuff for me or some of the, or Sydney and some of those autographs are fading. Um, it's not the end of the world cause that's not what I value on a personalized thing anyway. Right. Uh, but, but some of them are fading. We've had that problem with some items in our company. We've had it with other companies that we purchased from where, uh, Sharpie's, tend to fade under bad situations or under adverse situations. The uh, ones that seem to last the longest for me are paint pens mm-hmm. um, because they're, they're more of an acrylic or base or I don't know what's in them, but they, uh, they tend to last longer even on photographs. So wherever you can use a paint pen, I would personally use it. Um, deco pens are, are ones that we buy on a regular basis uh, we still use Sharpies under certain circumstances on jerseys and things. Again, a paint pen is, is great. Um, but you got to be careful that the signature is, you know, the, some of these guys actually sign so fast and the problem with paint pens is they can drip. So yes. y- you can ruin an item very quickly. And we've gone through that story about P- Pat Patrick Kane Kane. ruining his suit because he one dripped on his suit, but so paint pens are great. Um, and uh, Sharpies can be used, but especially if you're um, waiting outside for an autograph from a player, they don't want to be uh, priming pens or doing anything. So you got to basically use what's convenient for them. I, I think it's important too to note Sharpies specifically, it, it's more so the black Sharpies that fade on glossy glossy photos <clears throat> excuse me a lo- some some companies have started to use less gloss on their photos in an attempt to have have the 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 uh, ink actually stick to the the photo a little bit better we've kind of followed suit in that a little bit blue sharpies are often accepted as as a little bit more consistent although i do know quite a number of players that carry around a black Sharpie with them and still sign most of their quote unquote hotel autographs with a, right. with a black Sharpie. That's just what they've gotten used to. And some of them don't have issues with it. I think just more consistently, you're less liable to have the fading of an autograph if you use blue over black. But I think the most important thing is to make sure that it's in a a, a uh, climate controlled room or area out of direct sunlight. Uh, uh, I know you you had asked as well, uh, uh, Zach, about some questions on how to properly preserve the the. Autographs. Yeah, here's the biggest challenge that you have is one of the ways to prevent the light from fading a signature, any kind of light, whether it's uh, fluorescent or or uh, external light, is to use ultraviolet. Um, glass. glass or plexiglass. And the problem with that is it is extremely expensive. So if you have a hundred dollar autograph, you don't want to be putting $200 worth of plexiglass on there to preserve it. Right. If you've got a, a $2,000 autograph or in this applies to artwork or anything else, you might want to use that. Uh, and it's not non-glare glass, it's ultraviolet preventative glass. So it's a whole different ball game. And that's for something of a very high value. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think. I think the the most that you can do to keep the elements away from it, the better. The more you can do, the 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 better. And we've had some situations where people come to us years later and say our signatures have faded. And I've I've literally seen it, unfortunately, in some cases where the uh, customer will take a photograph of the item on a wall, and the item is right next to a window. Yeah, and and they're expectation is that well it's not in direct sunlight so it's not going to fade but unfortunately just the sun being in the room is enough to do that i mean we're talking 10 years here yep. you leave a car out outside in your driveway for 10 years that's also going to well, i have a piece of art that was done in my bedroom and it's next to the not right direct light but the whole the whole limited edition 
uh, lithograph is right. faded drastically. Right. There's nothing you can do. No, nothing. And that's can... ink that's embedded in the print, and it's still going to happen. Exactly. So, Zach, you also had a quick question about different pro- different pens for different products. If you're out there looking to get some signatures for yourself, uh, I think you're you can't go wrong with a blue sharpie, especially for some photos. Uh, you might want to look at Uchida has a good line of deco pens, deco color pens. Uh, the the very fine lines are great for things like pucks. Uh, some people like to sign their jerseys with a Stetler. Stetler is a a, a fairly um, non intrusive pen. It's easy. It, you don't have to prime it or anything like that. We do typically prefer some of the the the, the thicker deco color pens to sign some of the jerseys as well. The, the numbers specifically, they do t- take a little bit more priming. And then there's uh, Unipaint is a company that has some very good pens out there as well uh, in in some some a variety of colors, like some of the fluorescent colors that we'll use to sign some of our larger canvases, right. the oranges, the blues that look really good with like an Edmonton and a, and and a wider felt tip. The yeah. other thing is, and and you'll notice one of the most successful things we've done is Sidney Crosby pucks and we've always used a gold uh, paint pen with yeah, that yeah. and um, I haven't seen a problem with that other than it can smudge very easily so yes. you got to give it time uh, make sure you don't stack things or or let the air get to it so that it dries properly yeah That's those would be uh, extra fine I think it's you cheat is the company that makes yeah. those uh, deco color pens so Zach if you're looking for uh, a little bit of a collection they're expensive but they should last you pretty long you do have to be careful though once you prime the pen it's our its life cycle has begun to count down so uh, if you do prime it and it's just for one autograph you can you can put it away, but make sure the next time before you bring it out to ask someone for an autograph that it's still working because the last thing you want to do yeah. is hand them the item in the pen. They go to try to sign it and, and get nothing out of it. Uh, so, Zach, thank you for your questions there. Um, Greg Close had a good question that is more to do, and this is kind of as we'll shift into an element of, of marketing and sales. He has a question. He says, has Frameworth ever considered charging their customers an extra $10 to $15 per mystery box? For example, a Penguins mystery box, Team Canada mystery box, and holding a random draw for all those who purchased for a special jersey. For instance, if Frameworth sold all 100 mystery boxes, they could reward one of their customers with a nice jersey worth approximately $1,500. If all 100 boxes were sold for $1,500, uh, dollars more than than that would equate or for the same scenario frame with could reward two customers each with one jersey for 750 um essentially just giving a an idea for for a, a marketing tactic and a sales tactic and the reason why i wanted to bring this up you know we have discussed things like this we have gotten into this realm of 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 giveaways or or promotions on top of the items themselves but it's a great it's a great way to look at how the item itself sometimes isn't enough to uh, uh, to kind of bring yourself into the market the way you want to with full force. It's a great idea, Greg. And I wanted to ask you, Dad, you as the marketer, uh, definitely uh, one of the, the the biggest marketers of the company, wh- wh- where do you get these ideas from and what sorts of ideas do you have that, well, that inform this? From people like Greg. <laughs> uh, Greg, that is an amazing idea. We do something like that currently with our mystery box. In fact, we're going to be bringing out a Sidney Crosby mystery box in the next, well, I think it's this week. So by the time you hear this, it'll already probably be sold out because sure. we always sell it to Sydney Crosby boxes. Um, but within that box, there's a golden ticket for one of the boxes to get a game game used uh, Sydney Crosby stick. Right. And that is in the marketplace for about $3,000 Canadian. Right. So that's the bonus. Out one, so out of 100 boxes, there'll be one stick in there. But what you your idea about adding a draw after the fact I love. So I'm going to add that to this next project. Um, it's unfortunate that it, well, if you buy a mystery box, you're going to hear about it in the POP that we launch. So we are going to, after the fact, including the stick, we'll draw for a Sidney Crosby jersey for one of the uh, people. Now I have to decide whether it's, uh, it'd be too difficult to say. I'm thinking now my mind's Welcome. going, is it one of the ideas would be just to, for anybody that didn't win a jersey, but I wouldn't know who those people are. Right. So we'll just do a draw after the fact for another jersey for one of the hundred boxes that sell out. How's that? Welcome to what it's like to be in a management meeting with with my dad, Brian Aaronworth, as an idea comes up and he just figures it out on the fly and says, let's do it for the one we have planned going out in the next hour or so. It's it's <laughs> it's pretty common, but it gets the job done. It gets the job done. So Greg, I, I you know, thanks for- Great for, suggestion suggesting that and I think it kind of speaks to you know what we've tried in the past you know with things like 
Um, I, I know that that out in the industry, there there are some opportunities where you can kind of uh, buy a an opportunity or buy a, a portion of a chance to win a jersey or a set of jerseys or something along those lines. I know we used to refer to them as razes uh, online on, on Facebook. Sometimes they don't take as kindly to, to that word anymore. But generally speaking, uh, that that was something that we were interested in potentially getting involved in. We know that it's it's a very, it's a booming industry, things like box breaking as well. But, you know, we work with a lot of box breakers and a lot of people who would handle these draws. Uh, unfortunately, we don't want to upset them. So we have to find ways to get creative and not sort of step on anyone's toes and in order to do that, Dad, you would actually come up with an idea of somewhat of a guarantee, almost like a reverse version of these. Do you yeah, want to talk this about was this bit? was uh, very similar to what. For those of you who aren't familiar with a Raz or a box break, is on uh, online you'll see a lot of people, a lot of um, some of our very good customers. Um, they purchase jerseys and they um, they put them in you know mystery situations where you have a, you, you don't pay the full price you pay a small fee and you have a chance of winning it um the problem with that is if you don't win it you don't get anything and that's a gray area i believe we don't do that so but we like the concept so what we did was we reversed it we said anybody that purchases this product at a very good price right. whether it's a puck or a photo or a, a canvas or whatever we sell uh, we would give a special price on that. But in addition to that, we would draw one name uh, for or one or two or three names for a jersey. So you can you automatically get what you're looking for, right. but you get a chance. So it's really more of a draw than than what they call a Raz. Kind of a kind of a similar idea to what Greg was suggesting of of have you know you purchase the item you want, but there is also in addition to that item the chance to win something else at the end of it. And hey, Greg, I got a, I got a secondary thought now. So <laughs> all right, here we go. This is a, a double promotion. So when we do that draw, uh -huh. we're going to do it on this podcast. Hey, I love that. So now anybody that is entered is is forced forced forced. To listen to this to listen podcast to, to find out if they won or not. How's that? Uh, that sounds great. I'm I'm picturing a, a, like the scene from Clockwork Orange where they sit there with their eyes peeled open <laughs> and they have to watch this on YouTube. Drops in the eyes all the time. I remember that movie too. Most people wouldn't maybe. I don't oh know. man, it's a great one. It's a great one. Um, <laughs> I think you and I have that in common that we have both dressed up as the Droogs from Clockwork yeah. Orange for Halloween. At great Halloween costume. Because you, all you're doing is wearing white pants, white shirt, and a hat, bowler hat, <laughs> and you're not uncomfortable all night long just paint an eyelash on. I, I I wore, instead of like, you know, some people wear the khakis, the white khaki. If you're not familiar with what we're talking about, look up a clockwork orange to see the outfits of a droog, and, and you'll, you'll be familiar with it even if you don't realize you are. But I had long johns on, under just white long johns, like long underwear on under the cod piece that you wear as a part of it. And I lost the cod piece halfway through the night somehow. <laughs> On the dance floor. It's not like I was doing anything. Anyways, I had to make my way home. And this is before Uber. So I was on public transit, just walking home in my sweaty long johns <laughs> with a with a bowler hat on and mascara in one eye. And, and I was then like, I bailed him out a little later. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. It's on my permanent record now. Uh, so great, uh, great suggestion, Greg. And I'm glad we could speak on that a little bit. Got a few more questions that we want to get into here. Um, a fun question that I don't have an answer to, but I wanted to bring it up just because it's uh, 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 kind of quirky and we welcome quirky questions like this as well. Justin Palermo has the question. How about a fun one, Mikey? Sydney being from Nova Scotia, does he prefer the official food of Halifax, the Donaire, or the Pennsylvanian favorite, the Philly cheesesteak? That's a good question. We're going to have to ask him next time we see him because I don't know for well, sure. Well, I do know he loves the Donaire. You do know I that. don't know about the Philly cheesecake. Uh, uh, what was it? The, the Philly cheesesteak for well, Pennsylvania, that, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. No, there's actually something else in Pittsburgh uh, that we went to before a game. And it's a little place downtown. It's not Philly cheesecake or Philly cheesecake, <laughs> cheesesteak, cheesesteak. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, it's something else that they make in a restaurant down there that, that they're famous for in Pittsburgh. I don't know if he eats those, but he does like the Daenerys cause we had um, for his cup celebration, we had a party there and, I couldn't believe how good this pizza was. And they had this special meat on it. Right. And they said, oh, have you ever had a dinner? You got to go down to this shop. And I think it was about two in the morning that we all party broke and we all went down there and That's had what you those. do. Yeah, That's what you amazing. do. I, I went to school. I think I mentioned this before on the podcast. I went to school in Halifax and it was notorious at the edge of downtown uh, where all of the bars kind of... Uh, 
uh, meet in one area, they have what's called Pizza Corner, yes. where there are three pizza shops on all side, and, and those those will switch between different Donair shops and everything. A Donair is similar to a Euro, if you're not familiar with what we're talking about. Shaved meat, very often. Uh, it's a Donair meat and Donair sauce is, is what they're familiar with. But Pizza Corner is just notoriously where you would go to get two things. Pizza, to sober you up, and in a fight because you had all the drunk people in Halifax there just picking a fight and hungry for Donaire. Those are the two things you could guarantee you were going to get at Pizza Corner all the time. Um, so Justin, thanks for the question. I'm glad you actually had an answer for that. I wasn't sure. I, I yeah. wouldn't have been able well, to I help don't, I know he likes the Donaire. I don't know about the other one. Fair. Uh, so uh, here, here's a question that that you can address, Dad, because I know you have some thoughts on it. Uh, Augie Malekovich uh, has a question for the limited edition jerseys. Were any of the numbers one or number 87 in this case for Sidney Crosby, uh, numbered jerseys put into circulation or are they all set aside for Sydney? Well, yes. First of all, they are all set aside for Sydney if he wants them. If he wants them. Uh, but many times he doesn't. He's not into that. You know, the most important things are certain game use jerseys that he may put aside, specialty jerseys, obviously the 2010 Olympic jersey and right. whatever he feels is important. Um, then from there... Uh, we have decisions to make. And in the early days, a lot of them got tucked away. And actually, I'm just, you know, doing an inventory and finding them now. Right. Whether we keep them, whether we hold on to them for the future, whether we sell them at a premium, obviously, they are a premium item, uh, or or release them. Uh, we haven't made any decisions. Right now, it's not a something that I'm considering doing. Um you know, I do have my own personal collection, which is based on putting something away of everything he ever did. Right. Which was great um, initiative, I think, because it's <laughs> great, I'm great initiative. Some of the things that uh, that people I didn't think were worth anything, and some of them I put three or four away because now eh, they weren't selling that big. I just right. put them on a shelf and find out now that they're worth five times what they were back in the day. So. Right. So uh, the answer really is, yes, they're initially pulled from the inventory uh, along with low numbers or, or towards the end of the edition. Those we tend to launch at some point. Uh, numbers 1 to 10, numbers 80 to 87. Yep. Uh, but then um, some of those will get released, but 1 and 87 are tucked away. Yeah, and it you know it may sound strange to the collector to know that certain numbers are 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 not immediately put out into the public. However, I think all collectors know that some numbers do mean more than others and have a higher value. Even things like doubles, uh, things like odds and evens, you know, or ten. A lot of collectors out there, which I found interesting, I've met a few a few out there that in a limited edition, regardless of the player, regardless of the team, they always want their number. So, say they chose my favorite number being twenty two. I want number twenty two of as a limited edition right. of anything. Now, as a as a secondary, maybe if it's out of five hundred, I could get number one. 22 or 222 right. but to always have something to link the collection together could be personal or it could be because they want to sell it as a as a group uh, down the line um but yeah all collectors kind of know that that if we put it out there to say you know you choose your number there are select numbers that are going to be fought after by the people who get them first and that's that's just common um, well, one of the things too that value uh, that collectors value is if you have, and we found this recently with the Ramuski jerseys that we found, uh, people wanted the same number for the home and away. The collectors right. that wanted a home and right. away, do you have number twelve? I have twelve white. Do you have number twelve blue? Right. So those are other ways that people value the numbers and yeah, and, and kind of so. get around needing number one or number eighty seven right. or whatever the number is of of the player. So a great question there, and and uh, hopefully that sheds some some light on what sorts of limited edition numbers are available off the hop for any new product releases. Speaking of new product releases, I want to draw attention. If you're watching over on YouTube, dad, you've got a giant canvas behind you. One of my uh, favorite things. Do you want to launched. talk about that? Before? If you're not watching on YouTube, you can go take a look at it. Uh, it's been in the background, uh, but I'll describe it for the listener. It is a, what is that four feet by six feet? Something like that. Uh, 40 by 60, yeah. 40, 40 by 60 inches canvas, fully stretched, fully framed of uh, an action shot of Sidney Crosby. Almost like one of those, uh, like a fathead sticker you'd put on the wall, except it's a giant canvas. Right. Uh, so a little bit more robust. It, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we call this the gallery collection. Okay. Um, I like to have a name for every collection that we do. Skyline jerseys or Skyline right. collection. Um, 
this was just something that uh, came up as I was sitting watching, uh, looking at some things that came over my Instagram feed, which were great big um, canvases of movie stars. And, and, and it's a lifestyle thing, so it would hang over a couch and it would take up the whole wall over the couch, which I thought was really right. cool. Really become the centerpiece of the room. I'm not sure all those things that come across my Instagram feed are licensed, especially right. those things where you got the player holding up a jersey. Right. And, you know, you, I know Bobby Orr is not holding up a, a cheap poster of himself and it's got, <laughs> looks like his hands, et cetera, but they're not. My dad's it's, discovering Photoshop for all yeah, of you so listening. Yeah. <laughs> this is a thing, is it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so the, so the canvas that I, um, that we've been producing in 20 by 29s and I'm thinking how, I asked our guy, how, how big can we make our canvases? And they said, well, anything 40 inches wide by as long as we want. Right. And I thought, wow, that would be cool. So we did this one of Sydney, and it's been a huge success. We, we've we launched it in very small numbers. Uh, it is a limited edition, and it is a signed version. The one behind me is the prototype, so it's not signed yet. Right. Uh, it was done before Sydney came to town, so I didn't want to be shipping it down to Pittsburgh or whatever. Um, but he signed a number of them. I think we're almost out of them now. And then obviously that turns to the secondary market. Uh, and it was so popular that we've done one with Tavares. We've done one with Marner. In right. fact, Mitch liked it so much that, that he's got one at his house. And then he had his, his, uh, for Christmas, um, his dad phoned me and said, can we get one of, um, Mitch's brother, Chris caught this great fish. Yeah. And so I, I did a specialty custom canvas for Chris, his brother with this great big walleye, same size, 40 by 60, which then I got the idea <laughs> to and give my- you, you and your mother one with your fish for the cottage. And it, I mean, they're awesome. They they're in the whole yeah. wall. They're, they're really, um, an eye catcher. Yeah. So we're really excited about this new line. As we kind of uh, delve into the lifestyle brands for for some personalized canvases, we're, we're exploring that as well, always keeping our options open. And the one thing about those is, by the way, and I'm touched on licensing, these are all NHL licensed, right. player licensed. Right. So you can see things like this on Instagram, but they won't be licensed and, pro- and they won't be signed. I mean, I've seen one of P- Carey Price. He's one of our exclusive players. He's not going to sign any of those things, but right. we we will have them done up nicely. Yeah, I, you know what? It, you mentioned that, and we were talking earlier about trying to get involved in things like the the draws and giveaways, and and uh, uh, sort of the the reverse Raz kind of mentality. Yeah. And and one thing we didn't touch on there is is that you know. You mentioned there's a lot of gray area there. A lot of people have checked all their boxes and made sure that they're doing it above board and 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 we're not questioning any of that. But when we do get involved, because we've put ourselves on the radar as a licensee of the NHL, the NHLPA, the Hall of Fame, Hockey Canada, the alumni, et cetera, et cetera, we are kind of the first ones who are looked at to uh, ensure that what we're doing is, is more than above board, is completely above board. Right. And you mentioned these canvases are fully licensed and you do see a ton on Pinterest or Instagram or any of these ads of companies that will just pop up They'll offer these. They're not licensed. They're, the royalties are not going to the proper places. And if they get shut down, they just start a new Instagram just, ad right, company and, right. and do it all over again. Uh, so it's good to know before you do purchase any of those, if it matters to you, and, and it should, um, that the money is going to the right places. You should always make sure you know who you're buying from. We had Bruce Bennett on a few weeks ago uh, who mentioned that he often sees images that he took being replicated without his consent and he's not making anything of it. The licensing and the royalties are there to ensure that everyone from the player to the team, to the photographer, to everyone involved in getting that, making that something special is compensated properly for it. Right. And you'll have a hard time convincing people that that's something that they should care about. Right. Um, you know, and you, it goes right down to, to the music world. Um, and, for sure. And, and taping movies the- and, we care about it. We do things by the book. Um, and a lot of the players refuse to sign things that aren't. So that's, yeah. that's where we'll, you know, we're, where we come in and you can make your own decisions. Yeah. And we, we spoke about that a little bit on the last episode with regards to pricing and licensing and that sort of thing. So if you have any questions about that, or you want to hear more of an in-depth discussion on it, check out last week's episode, also a Q and a episode. So if you're enjoying the tone of this and you haven't heard the last one, there's a full other one out there. Uh, speaking of, we have one more question that I want to get to as we kind of wrap this one up, a question that was posed to us, I believe through YouTube actually, uh, for Dominic Plant. 
Uh, can you guys talk about fanatics and their effect on the sports memorabilia business? And I think we can use this as a jumping off point to kind of talk about the industry as a whole, not to single out uh, anything that fanatics is doing. They're doing a fantastic job of what they're doing, uh, slightly different than what we're doing, a different kind of market. Uh, but yeah, we can absolutely talk about what the industry was pre and post uh, fanatics getting involved, especially as it pertains to hockey. Right. Well, this is a double edged sword for me because one, I was, I was, taking advantage of a situation like that when we started and we kind of develop, developed the memorabilia business for hockey in a big way. Uh, taking so, advantage of a situation? Well, in terms of being able to control the marketplace. Because you know, there were we no competitors. So, well, there were, but there weren't in the hockey world. Right, even right. the upper deck wasn't paying much attention to the, to the memorabilia side uh, in terms of hockey. You know, the big three U.S. sports were there. And then you have um, other companies like Steiner and that that were in the business. But we really developed it and we had we had some of the best, we still do have some of the best players in the hockey world, which means we can control the narrative. Right. Um, Fanatics has taken that to a whole different level. Yeah. I mean, one, they're a billion dollar company. They control the NHL, all the major sports websites. Yes. Um, so all the all the products go through there. Uh, they they manufacture jerseys. Um, although Adidas has the rights for the on ice jersey, Fanatics has the other rights. Um, back when they first were kind of building their world, we were had players that they've tried to take over and have taken over. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them have been very loyal to Frameworth. Others just go where the money is. And it's not necessarily about the money. It's, there's a lot of pressure that fanatics, as big as they are, can put on players and agents, mostly agents, uh, to say, look, you know, we're going to bring you not only hockey, we're going to bring you football, right. baseball, uh, all the other sports, and um, we're going to buy all these items from you. So we want your specific player. We want uh, Evgeny Malkin. We want you know, um, all these players that they have used to purchase from p- yeah. people like ourselves. And so they're now taking a much bigger role in that. Um, that's business. I'm yeah. not, yeah, I'm not happy with it, but I'm not, I'm, I totally understand it. Um, the players, some of the players, it's not about the money. It's about relationships. Sidney Crosby being one, Kerry Price being another that have stayed with companies like ourselves, which we, called boutique companies where we look after people personally and we look after their families and, and do all the right things that we do as a smaller company. Fanatics is, is more about the, the big bucks and they'll pay the players and they'll, um, they'll put pressure on the agents to move their players to them. So we haven't where, so it's flip-flopped. I took advantage of that in the early stages with a company like CAA, which is one of the biggest agencies in the world. Uh, I still have good relationships with Pat Brisson and, and JP Berry and a number of the people there. Uh, but I totally understand that the pressure coming from fanatics to take on any new player and they'll argue that, well, we didn't ask for it. I know we're not getting any new player from, from, uh, from uh, CAA that uh, that Fanatics wants because they're just going to outbid me. And it's, it's changed the the way that it works. And I feel like this is kind of, I mean, even within the industry of sports, this, this new kind of uh, layout of there being a major company that, that can deal with hundreds and hundreds of people and athletes and this and that because they have a model that they can follow and just kind of plug things into it versus, as you said, sort of this boutique approach to it, which we've kind of maintained – that's, you know, it starts where there's only one, the money comes in and then there are two, one, one where if a player wants to feel like they're, you know, special in the eyes of the people who are representing them and, and want to be part of something smaller and have a little bit more control over their product line, this and that, then they'll go to that. And another that is, that is a little bit more interested in, in maybe just focusing on the game. They don't care as much about the product line, totally respectable. That's totally fine. But the options are there. And it's the same thing as, you know, talking to, uh, to Darren Ferris, for example, you know, what is, what is his agency uh, offer uh, in comparison to some of the power agencies out there. And he likes the fact that his clients are his, you know, he works with them directly and I'm right. sure that the clients respect that as well. So whether it's in player agency or it's in sports memorabilia, 
within the realm of sports or outside of the realm of sports, it always feels like there's going to be the big versus the boutique. There's and- another aspect to this too, that there, that our listeners are probably interested in, which is, is it good or bad for the industry? Mm-hmm. And that's a different perspective completely. Sure. Um, monopolies create higher prices. There's no question. You got a monopoly on something, you're able to charge whatever you want within reason. And so the prices go up. And I just got a, a price list from Upper Deck and wow, what, what the prices are and nothing wrong with Upper Deck. Um, people that have collected Gretzky and Jordan and, and all the big name guys over the years um, are thrilled with what's happened because the prices have gone through the roof. Um, 2500 3000 5000 10000 US for you know top players in various type of items is where they're at right, right now. Right. Uh, the less com- competition in the business, uh the the higher the prices are going to get. So the people that are already established, but will that affect the business moving forward? Will it make it affordable for people um to get into this type of business or does it kill the the early stages of the industry. So a lot of people are getting in with players that are more affordable and then work their way up. That's one thing. Um, so you can get a past player or an up and coming player. Maybe there's more speculation on players come coming into the league, but even that's being grabbed that's, up right now. That's the, that's where it feels like it could become a little bit of an issue where before it did feel like, the player had to sort of prove themselves a little bit more before getting the sorts of prices uh, that some of them are demanding now. And it's not a shot against any of the players because I'm sure they will live up to their name. But right well, off... Some do, some most do, some don't. Right. Uh, in the, I, I think about the pricing that Sidney would have had, for example, when he first came to the league. It was, it was high, higher than a lot of other people right. coming into the league, but it wasn't where it is now. Wasn't unaffordable, wasn't for, unaffordable. for the most people. And now there are rookies coming into the league that haven't played a game whose prices are comparable. Well, so here's here's our dilemma, which is, look, you know, Sidney Crosby's arguably, you know, the most talented player, one of the most talented players currently playing, but his numbers and his stats and his accomplishments far exceed uh, Just Connor about, McDavid. Right, right. Con- but the prices of Connor McDavid started in, and even this... Uh, you know, the new guys that are coming into the league, uh, Suzuki, yep. what has he done yet? Right. Um, but he's much higher than any other player in the past years that have come into the league. That's the choice of upper deck. That means that they're taking a chance on whether he's going to be that good. Lafreniere in, in New York didn't really have the opening start that they had hoped for. Right. So they were... In, in a lot of people's eyes, overcharging for him. Now he may come around and he is coming around to, yeah. to be the player that, that they hope for, but some of the guys don't. And mm-hmm. then you're stuck with a, well, they want to throw stones, but a Gilbert Brule who was expected to come in with great things and, and never really panned out or a, a Cody Hodgson, right. um, big high draft picks that didn't really pan out and didn't last very long. <laughs> hey, we got stuck, not stuck. I love the guy, but Nail Yakupov, number one pick. Mm-hmm. Um, if we tried to launch him at the prices that upper decker fanatics are bringing new players into the league with, um, I mean, we're still sitting on Yakupov stuff. We would, we would have died. And the crazy thing is, is it would have been warranted. I mean, the, the, the hype that he had coming into the league would have justified following that model. If anyone is to follow that model, I, I, I hesitate. And I think you're the same way to do that because you do want there to be a natural growth and an earning, like you otherwise, gotta earn it. yeah. it's like the gold standard has been taken away from the industry of saying like, you can charge X amount per signature, as long as it's relative to their overall stats right. and performance. Now it seems like a lot of it is, is on hype and on, on potential as opposed to well, actuality. This is actually affected. So we've been taking a lot of flack about the prices of Sidney Crosby going up right. uh, over the last couple of years. And the, the, the thought process on that is simply, what has McDavid done? What has Matthews done compared to Sidney Crosby in terms of accomplishments? Right. And yet their price is comparable or higher in some cases than Sidney's were. Right. That just doesn't make any sense. Right. So anything new that's come out in the marketplace is going to be a higher price. And I'm, I'm not going to go back to Sydney and say, well, you're not worth as much as Matthews as McDavid and McDavid, because he certainly is. Exactly. Um, he'll be, 
you know, fast track to the Hall of Fame. He's he's got so many accomplishments under his belt. So he's going to be there. And um, until McDavid wins the Stanley Cup, until Matthews wins the Stanley Cup, and with the Leafs the way they are, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, then they don't own the stature that Sydney does in my eyes, and consequently shouldn't be sold at a at a higher price. And here's here's one thing to look at. I know a lot of people are are kind of. Uh, I don't know, maybe stressed out about the fact that the prices are going up for Sydney, but that, I mean, it's, it's moving forward. I mean, if you've, if you've purchased his products in the past, guess what? They're those, now more those valuable. Those people are thrilled. Exactly. So I get being worried about where the prices are going, but I think if you just take a snapshot of where the figures are right now, they're in line with the rest of the industry. It just meant we had to raise his pricing right. to get there. Now keep in mind, there's two types of collectors. Uh, one, person just cat gets it because they love the player and they're right. really and i i think this is a little bit bullshit they're really not concerned about the price going up mm-hmm. everybody likes to see the value of the merchandise could, yes, go up sure sure but then there's the other guy that literally speculates like a stamp collector like a coin collector like any other or, or a stock uh guy that buys stock sure they buy it low they want to sell it high or or at least know that the value's gone right. up so those people um, the difference is, is that you used to be able to speculate. You got to be a lot sharper now to find a guy that nobody else sees in the value, um, and then ends up, you know, looking for that player to do well and sell later at a higher price. These guys are getting offered top dollar before they do anything. Right. right. So unless you find that guy that nobody else has got locked in right at the beginning, a year or two before they even come into the league. And and I can't complain. I was a guy that started all this <laughs> exactly. with Sydney and yeah, Ramuski, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. but um, but again, I didn't come out with those kind of prices. Right. I mean, just so just kind of a snapshot of where the industry is at, where pricing is at, and why it's there. I mean, we could talk about that for hours. That's uh, that's an enormous part of the industry and the way things are going. Um, and we appreciate all the questions uh, that people had sent in. Again, if you want to hear yourself on the podcast and get a little bit of shout out, sign off pod at framework.com. We are also going to be going out to some of the groups over there on Facebook, the collectors groups to get some questions from all of you guys. Uh, I love doing these sorts of episodes. Even if you have a suggestion for a topic to focus on for an episode, we'd love to hear it as well. Or just give us your feedback, ratings and reviews. Once again, uh, dad, thanks so much for your insight. I hope you enjoy doing these Q and A ones doing them. as much yep. as I do. Uh, 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 that is the, the, the beautiful voice of Brian Aaronworth, president of Frameworth Sports Marketing. I am Mikey Aaronworth, host of the Sign Off Podcast, and this is us signing off. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we made it to the end of yet another episode. Thanks again so much for joining us. You can find videos of all of our episodes on YouTube by searching the Sign Off Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at Frameworth Sport or Instagram at Frameworth Sports. And hey, if you're not sick of me yet, you can find me on Twitter over at at Retrograde Mikey, or you can always find me embarrassing myself over on Instagram at Aaronworth. The Sign Off is a proud product of Fadu Productions and Sad Styles Productions, executive producers, Mikey Aaronworth and Andrew Bascom. Until next week, this is Mikey Aaronworth, signing off. Furnished by Sad Styles Productions. Get into it!